righteousness and peace kiss each other. And Ephesians 4, 14 to 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Dear God, above all, help us keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. You, having purified our souls by your truth, bring us to a sincere brotherly love. Help us love one another earnestly from a pure heart in this dark, broken world. Let us become a beacon of light through your truth, which brings perfect love. It is through the name of Jesus, who is truth and love, that I pray. Amen. Good morning. Praise the Lord. God is good. I want to make a special thanks to Phil and Bob and Vicki. They've been working, and Tony, working tirelessly trying to get the new, or getting the sound system back running. But thank you so much. I printed something out for those that can't see and are listening on phone, I'll give some explanation. But if you look at what I'm holding here, what do you see? Now, you say that that's six, and that's true, isn't it? But if I held the same piece of paper this way, what do you see? So you're saying that a six and a nine are the same thing? But the reality is, if we look at a printed piece of paper, it can look like a six, and if you turn it upside down, it can look like a nine. But the truth is somehow evasive, depending on the perspective from which you look at it. Within our society, it seems that truth is no longer a high value. This week is a week of remembrance and transition. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. Let's remember in reverence the abuse of our African-American brothers and sisters and continue to work at anti-racism. Tuesday is Inauguration Day. Let's be praying for peace as there are many threats. We're living in a time when truth has become so relative that we're uncertain of almost everything. Misinformation is so prevalent that we're unsure if anything is true. I was listening to the radio on the way down and the program was talking about a social media owner who was talking about freedom of speech. While I endorse freedom of speech, this person was arguing, but we must allow people to give him misinformation if they wish to. I'm perplexed at the dynamics that information, misinformation and, trust and untruths have brought to us as a nation. It seems that people only feel they need to tell the truth if they're in a court of law, and even then, we wonder. What is truth?
we question election results, even if they've gone through certification and various court processes. We question the safety of medicine and vaccines. As we approach a Martin Luther King Day tomorrow, I can't help but think about the horrific abuse of African-American men in the Tuskegee Project when they were promised treatment and went for decades carrying disease. No wonder there are questions about trusting government medicine. We reap what we sow. Some years ago, I had been doing business with a Muslim hardware store, and the owner was a righteous man. He hired many people with disabilities, offering them jobs and dignity and purpose. I had purchased a number of things that day, and as I walked away from the uh, cashier, the very capable cashier in a wheelchair, I realized that she had given me more change than I was due. And I returned and explained the mistake. She seemed a bit surprised that I would return when it wasn't to my benefit. Sometime later, I again traveled the two hours to the same store to purchase materials for a school building that I was building at that time. I had a young man with me from the village and we loaded the roofing and other expensive materials. And when I went to pay for my purchase, I realized that I had left my briefcase at home and I had no money with me. And I apologized to the owner as I prepared to unload my purchase. And he said, no, just take it and pay me when you come back in a couple weeks. As I was riding home, the young man that was with me said, Claire, how did you do that? And I said to him, integrity does not change its character even when it's to your disadvantage. You reap what you sow. In Psalms chapter 85, I want to look at a different side of truth as well. It says in King James, it says it this way. It says mercy and truth have met together. Sorry, I don't have two hands to do this, but mercy and truth have become one. And righteousness and peace have kissed each other. This scripture is one of my favorite, and I believe it describes what the gospel is really about. We know biblical truth. And many of us have used the Bible and the verses of the Bible to weaponize and harm other people. In Ephesians 4, again, we read, but speak the truth in love, and we say, the truth hurts. Let me stab you a little bit. But I'd like to look at a biblical truth and I'd like us to explore this truth through various scriptures as it develops from the Old Testament to the New. In Genesis 2, it says, And the Lord said it's not good for man to be alone, so it's good for him to have a wife or a woman. But if we read in Exodus it says this in uh, chapter 20 and verse 14. It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. So it begins to reign in the, well, it's good to have somebody, regardless of who to. It could be somebody just as long as it's not your neighbor's wife or somebody else's. And then in Leviticus chapter 20, 
we read this, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. So what is truth? Is it, it's not good for a man to be alone? Or is it beyond that to say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Or is it if you commit adultery, you should be killed? In John chapter 8, we see Jesus interacting with somebody who was caught in adultery. And you could follow this train of thought with various sins if you wanted to, but I chose this one today because I'm not aware of anybody messing this way. But you might be. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone st such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order that they have basis for accusing him. Think about the scripture. They said that Moses said we should stone such a woman, but Moses said you should kill. Didn't say how. But you understand, they're using truth and then they manipulate it to meet what they wanted in the way they had become known to use the scripture as a weapon. But the thing that fascinates me at this point the thing that fascinates me with this scripture in this story is they caught her in the very act of adultery, but it says nothing about the man. Doesn't it take two hands to clap? And Jesus doesn't even touch either of those issues that so easily he could have unbraided them and fed them through the cracks in the floor. But he says, he bends down and he begins to write with his finger. And he kept, they kept on questioning him and he straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. And again he stepped down and began to write on the ground. I wonder what he wrote. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time until there was no one left. And Jesus asked, has no one condemned you? Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and sin no more. This is a story of mercy and truth coming together and being married together it's a reality. Yes, it is true. The woman and the man were caught in adultery. But religious leaders thought it was important to pay attention to what the woman was doing. And Jesus was concerned that mercy and truth had met together. In Matthew 9, we see this. Jesus says, For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners, but go and learn what it means. I desire mercy more than sacrifice. You see, we are living in a time when truth has become irrelevant. And lying is the norm. And when we read our social media posts, we're never quite sure. And we joke. We say it must have been true. I read it on social media. And sometimes I read it on the news. So it has to be true. 
or the government said it, so it has to be true. And we're never quite sure because we have been deceived in the past and once integrity is lost, it is almost impossible to rebuild. And Jesus goes on and he says this in Matthew chapter 22, and I know that I'm quoting a lot of scriptures today because I believe that the Bible is true and authoritative and it has something to say to us today. And it's relevant. In Matthew 22, Jesus hearing this, Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and Pharisees and got the Pharisees got together and one of them, an expert of the law, tested him in this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said this. He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the second is like it, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The reality is, if we want to deal with truth, we must start with one foundation. And the foundation is that God is one, and he is superior to all of us. We read the scriptures, it says, the fear of the Lord, or acknowledging him as Lord, is the beginning of wisdom, and I would say truth. The world does not center around me personally. And in case you're concerned, it doesn't center around you either. But we start with the acknowledgement, truth is that there is God and he is Lord of all. Recognizing that he has the power to destroy and heal. And I thank God that mercy and truth have come together. In John chapter 8, we read this. In verse 31 or 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I think many times we think if somehow we can grasp all of the truth of the scriptures and get it down to a formula, somehow we can make God do what we want God to do. Or use it so that we can manipulate other people to force them to do what serves us best. But when we know the truth, we recognize that I personally am a sinner needing God's grace and mercy. And I thank God that he loves me even when he knows the things about me that you don't. What is the truth? You know, many times we find ourselves wondering, how do I know if that person's telling the truth? Let's take them to the court of law. And they put their hand on a Bible and they raise their right hand if it's not in a sling. And they swear that I tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But in Matthew 5, it says this, and again, you have heard it was said of the people of long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill, the Lord, fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. I tell you, this is Jesus' words, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear on your head, for you cannot make even one hair, white or black, or grow them back sometimes, depending on your situation. All you need to say is yes and no. Or in King James, it would say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. 
You'll find many Mennonites will refuse to swear in a court of law because of this scripture. Can we get back to the point of telling the truth regardless if it's to our benefit or not? If somebody says to us, is it true and you speak and they say, he spoke and I know it's true because he is consistent, he has integrity. And his answer is always true. Isn't that what God is calling us to? You realize that truth is complex as we looked at the story of adultery, God saying this and then this and then this. And yes, it's complex, but the reality is we can see a six or we can see a nine. And we need to look at the scriptures in the fullness recognizing there's more than one way to read some scriptures. But the truth is God is one. His word is authoritative. It has the power to, and capacity to change us and to identify in us the things that we need to change. You see, we as a nation, as a people, have walked away from truth, and we are reaping what we have sown. And even if a person is telling the truth, we're unsure. As somebody said this morning as I was listening to a program, they said the only honest answer a person can give now is they are unsure. Because they had been given so much information. Too often we have chosen specific scriptures and used them as weapons to harm each other. Truth hurts, we say. But the whole biblical truth is summed up in this way. Mercy and truth have met together Truth is given so that we can be merciful and bring transformation that is beneficial for all and not just for me. When you confess your truth, I am called to have mercy. When I know the righteous thing to do or the right thing to do, I will still remain at peace. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Speak the truth in love. We need to be people of truth during these very uncertain times. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are true. Lord, give us hearts of integrity and truth. Lord, we pray for peace in our nation. Bring us back to you. May you be Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.